Hello, and welcome to Unit 8 of an Introduction to Agent-Based Modeling. Uh, in this unit, it's a little different than some of our previous units. We're going to be talking about rather than what an agent-based model is and uh, what it can do for you, we're going to be talking about what it's been used for in the past, kind of where the roots of agent-based modeling come from. Uh, and I, you know, I save this for the end because I kind of want you to understand what an agent-based model is before we can talk where a lot about a lot where the components come from. Over the course of this talk, we're also going to be talking about what I would consider some classic models in this space, right? Uh, some agent-based models that kind of help us to have some building blocks of conversation because we can say, oh, that's like the segregation model or that's like the cellular automata model or something along those lines, right? And so I think that's helpful as well. And so I think understanding where agent-based modeling is coming from and other and some of the basic models there really help you understand your own models. And that's why I think this is an important part of this course. Now, to give you a little bit of an overview, um, we're going to, I've divided up the history into what I'm going to call roughly six vignettes, right? Um, now, uh, you know, and this is, this is actually, this chapter parallels, this unit parallels the appendix that's in the textbook, right? Now, Asian-based modeling, like many uh, modern disciplines out there, does not come out of one field or one space. It comes out of a variety of different fields. And a lot of times, those stories interact and interweave with each other. And so it's really hard to tell like a linear story that goes from beginning to end, which is why I, uh, Uri and I, when we were writing the textbook, divided up the history into kind of these vignettes, each of which kind of stands alone, emphasizing a particular aspect, but each interacts with some of the other vignettes in many and you'll see multiple people uh, who will show up in multiple, uh, uh, in different vignettes, right? And so the same people will be involved in different storylines as we try and weave these together. Um, so the storylines we're going to look at are cellular automata, which is what we'll talk about today, uh, genetic algorithms and complex adaptive systems, and kind of that background, logo and uh, some of the work that's been done in that space, object-oriented programming, uh, data and computational parallelism, so trying to understand the idea of having parallel objects doing things simultaneously, and uh, computational graphics and how that's affected uh, agent-based modeling. Uh, we do not claim this is a comprehensive history of agent-based modeling. It's a, you know, in some ways a personal history that emphasizes the aspects that we think are the most important and most relevant uh, to agent-based modeling. Um, so anyways, let's get on with the story with that regard. So the first story we're going to talk about is the development of the cellular automata. And um, we have alluded to cellular automata several times in this class, but we haven't actually uh, talked about where it came from or what it is. Uh, and in the next video lecture, I'm going to give you some taste of cellular automata in detail. But essentially, the developer of uh, the cellular automata, along with a man named Stanislaw Ulam, was Jean von Neumann. And you may have heard the name of von Neumann before. Von Neumann helped develop the first computer, the ENIAC. And in many ways, in the 1940s, he invented the modern uh, architecture that we still use to this day for most computers. And von Neumann got very interested in the idea of developing uh, self-replicating machines. Uh, partially, this was inspired because he realized that humanity would eventually need to explore beyond our own uh, planet. And so he wanted to be able to build machines. And this is in the 1940s. He wanted to be able to build machines uh, that would help us with that task, right? And so he wanted to develop machines that could self-replicate. And so in order to do that, he collaborated with Stanislav Ulam to create the rules of the cellular automata. And the cellular automata, the way he imagined it, is that you had a big lake of parts of computer machinery and then you had a, a tool kind of hovering over it, and that tool had a set of rules that said, if I see these parts, then I grab them and I put them together in this way, and I, I put them out there, right? And so the idea is that you could build a tool that could create another one of these tools that could then create another one of these tools and so forth, right? In reality, what he created was a theoretical construct within the computer, right, where each state of a particular cell was dependent upon the cells near it, and it could then use that to look at, up in a rule table what it should change to, what state it should change to in its next uh, time step, right? Uh, and that's the basic idea behind a cellular automata. Uh, he did eventually create what was called a universal constructor, and the idea behind a universal constructor was that you could feed it a string of instructions, and then it could create itself, including the instructions, 
right? So you can think about this as that the machine takes an instruction set, creates another machine that's an exact duplicate of the original machine, plus also has the instructions for creating yet another machine in it, right? Um, and this is what a universal constructor was. And one of the nice things about this is that you actually now allow for evolution because much like DNA, you can mutate the input instructions and get different results out, right? Um, however, this universal constructor required 29 different states for each of the cells. Not, and so the lookup table for how to compare all your states of your neighbors plus yourself and find what output you should create was massive, right? And a little bit unwieldy. So that actually brings us to our next uh, character in the story, which is John Conway. And John Conway was using a Go board to investigate cellular automata when he struck upon an interesting set of rules. He had this set of rules that he later called the game of life. And the idea was, if a cell has three neighbors, if a particular square on that uh, Go board or that checkers board has three neighbors, it becomes alive. In other words, it goes from dead to alive. Um, if it has two or three, and he called this the birth process, right? If it has two or three neighbors, it stays alive, it persists, right? And any other combination means the cell dies, either due to overcrowding or loneliness, right? Uh, and this is why he called it the game of life, right? Because it had these natural rules that happen. Now, it turns out that um, he published, he, he, he had these, been playing around with these rules, but it really gained popularity when in 1970, Martin Gardner, uh, picked up on the game for a mathematical uh, puzzles column he had in Scientific American, right? And it was a very famous column at the time among mathematicians, computer scientists, etc., uh, for the interesting puzzles that we describe. And so he published it there. That caused the popularity of the game in life to take off. A lot of people study it. And in fact, in 2009, Adam Gosher proved that the game of life is both um, is, un is a universal computer. Uh, meaning that it's Turing complete, meaning that anything that can be computed can be computed within the frames of the game of life. Now, um, uh, Conway himself had showed that you could create self reproducing behavior within the game of life, and we'll talk about that when we go to the rules. Now, at about this point and about the time that um, uh, Conway is doing some of his earliest work on the game of life, um, Arthur Burks, who is one of John von Neumann's students, picked up John von Neumann's um, collected essays on uh, cellular automata and edited them down. And in 1966, released a book called The Theory of Self-Reproducing Automata, right? Which actually contained many of the thoughts that were in von Neumann and many of the formal theoretical proofs uh, that were necessary to describe cellular automata and the power they are. Now, you know, and one of the important points about this is that this book describes the cellular automata and the self-reproducing systems as an existence proof, right? Clearly, we're not going to actually develop Mars by using software cellular automata, but the idea is that if we can do it in software, we can do it in real hardware, and we can build a system that could do self-reproducing behavior just like the cellular automata does, right? Now, the next major character who comes along is Stephen Wolfram, who um, uh, you may have known because he invented uh, Mathematica, owns a company that does a lot of great research into mathematical problems in interesting spaces. Uh, and, math and Wolfram's big contribution uh, to cellular automata theory was that he conducted a census of all of the 1D CA rules with radius one. Uh, so it turns out that there are the uh, a variety of rules in the hundreds for radius one that describe all the possible ways you can relate the relationship of the focal the cell to a uh, state to the output state, right? Um, and he was able to classify these rules into being uniform, in other words, they always produce the same output. Random, in other words, the output is unpredictable and you can't really tell what's going on. Cyclical, the output repeats in a pattern. And complex, meaning that the output has structure to it, but it's not one of these simple forms of uniform random or cyclical, right? And, and Wolfram actually goes on to claim that you can model the whole world using cellular automata, which is an interesting claim about where it is, right? Uh, and in the next video lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about how you could explore some of the rules of Wolfram's uh, 1D cellular automata spaces, right? Now, now that we have like a background of where cellular automata come, came from, who's contributed to it, what does this have to do with HFA's modeling? Um, 
Well, a lot of the developers of early agent-based modeling were aware of cellular automata. Um, and so, for instance, um, John Holland, uh, who along with, uh, uh, with um, uh, John Holland, who along with John Miller, published one of the first uh, papers using the word agent in the way we now use it in an agent-based model. Um, he was actually Jean von Neumann's, uh, sorry, he was um, Arthur Burke's student who was Jean von Neumann's student. And by the way, I'm John Holland's student, so it's an interesting chain there. But uh, uh, they, Holland was aware of the work that was being done in CAs. He was helping Burke's at times actually edit the volumes of, of the cellular automata work. But he did not think of cellular automata as the right tools to study the social problems that him and John Miller were interested in studying when they built uh, some of the early artificially adaptive economic agents, right? They they knew of them, they knew of what they could do, but they weren't, but they didn't think of these as the right tools. Instead, they built a new modeling framework, which was the agent-based modeling framework, right? Uh, so, and, and in fact, in, in preparing the textbooks, I got to interview a lot of the first agent-based modelers, and not one of them said that they thought of agent-based modeling as an extension of cellular automata theory. They, they obviously could see the similarities and see the relationship, but they thought of them as distinct fields from each other. And this is something that often gets confused in the literature at times, right? They, people say agent based modeling was an evolution of cellular toxin. In a way, maybe, but nobody actually directly made that evolutionary jump. It was more of agent based models were the things that were built. Uh, to solve the problems people are interested in, right? And they were obviously related to cellular automata, right? You can view each cell as an agent to the cellular automata. Von Neumann's models were in some ways the first computational models of biological systems or attempts to create the same phenomenon we see in biology within a computational system, which is often a lot of the goals of agent-based modeling. The scheduler is simple, is similar, right? In a cellular automata, you have these tick-based, these uh, step-based uh, events that go on, which you'll see in both the game of life and the 1D move, right? And Wolfram's classification scheme that he came up with the 1D cellular automata is very similar to a lot of current attempts to classify uh, complex systems into recognizable patterns of behavior, right? So in many ways, there are definitely distinct similarities, uh, but I think it's a somewhat of a mistake of, of trying to uh, you know, paint the past as this nice linear picture to say that ABMs were a natural extension of cellular automata. That uh, was not necessarily the case. Um, so that being said, uh, let's uh, take a look at some implementations of cellular automata in uh, the age-based modeling language known as that logo. <laughs>